months and because I haven't obviously had enough time to go and, yeah. Go on. Okay, uh, good morning everybody. Uh, thank you Lola. First I want to say thank you for the invitation and the collaboration with Tando. It's really amazing to be here. Um, so, um, part of the things that I do outside working at the university as a sociology professor, um, I'm part of a, um, a group called Free Gender. Um, and this, this group started in 2007, and it's a group of um, black lesbian women um, who came together um, when there was a huge crisis in South Africa um, of um, black lesbian women being murdered. Um, and, it, and we came together to try and agitate the state to do something about the murder and the rape of black lesbians in particular. Uh, and it was specifically black lesbians, and then later on it became, um, well, well, we started understanding the nature of violence that was affecting anybody who is um, not considered African um, in our societies. So because of your gender identity or your sexual orientation, etc., cetera, um, then the state and society took it upon itself to violate. Um, and, and so as a, as a group of activists, then we, we wanted, to, we wanted to, to push government to take a strong stand against sexual violence. Um, and so that, that's one of the things that I do. In other, other spaces, I do a, a variety of things, but a lot of the things that I do are really just about um, fighting for justice for, uh, for marginalized people. Uh, particularly lesbians, uh, trans people, um, uh, and gay men, especially within black communities, because we do know that it's very difficult to talk about sexuality and gender identity. Um, and not only is it difficult, but it's 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 considered uh, it's considered a topic that isn't isn't yeah taboo, but it's also it's, it's you know you're made to feel like an alien, and so finding ways of trying to engage society to realize that actually, you know, this is, this is part and parcel of the fabric of being African. Um, and, um, and that we can also understand, understand the nature of violence and how violence happens uh, to, to certain types of bodies. Um, and in addition to that, to, to find the intersectionalities of you know, understanding violence towards black women, violence towards black lesbian women, violence towards trans women, um, and violence towards um, people in society who are not considered South African. Yeah. I, I think we know um, who you're talking about when you're talking about violence towards people who are not South African. Um, well, we're familiar with that story, For sure. but, but, but we're not going to hold it against you. <laughs> because the real, um, uh, what's puzzling to me is, I mean, I've been to South Africa several times, and from a Niger for, as a Nigerian, I look at South Africa as a really progressive society, given the fact that you know it's the rainbow nation, the fact that you know we you haven't had the complexities that we have had um, around having a president who decided to cave into a really populist um, law around banning same-sex marriage, even though no one had gone to apply for one. But that's a different talk show. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, so tell us then, I mean, what, what, what is this you are telling us about our South Africa that we thought was a progressive society? Uh, <laughs> yeah, and the fellow South Africans will probably say, oh no, don't say the bad stories, but I think we all know that they, they you know, <laughs> there are many bad stories. Um, so um, it, it is true that there is something that is progressive about South Africa. Um, and for me, that thing only, only exists on paper. Um, so our constitution is really beautiful. Um, and everybody in the world wants to have this constitution. But we have it in the bookstore. Yes. <laughs> you see, we even sell it. I mean. <laughs> 
so it is a blueprint for all kinds of beautiful things. Um, but when you translate it into, into reality, it's, it, there's a huge disconnect. Um, and so even small things, I'll give an example so, uh, of this progressive nature. So um, one of the, uh, the most recent law that was passed, particularly for people uh, of same-sex orientation, was the Civil Union Act. Um, it was passed in 2006, and this act basically allowed same-sex couples to marry, and it was the first in the continent, as you all know. Right. And, um, and so upon um, investigating this act, or even before we started investigating the act as activists, what, what happened is that a lot of same-sex couples, black same-sex couples, would, would go to ask the state to marry them because that's what was afforded by the state, right? Uh, and then you would get, so you would go and get married to the Department of Home Affairs, and then you would get there, and, um, and the state officials will say, no, I can't do that. Uh, I can't marry you because I don't believe that you know you people should exist in that would be the language. You people should exist, um, and um, and my religion doesn't allow me to do it. Or they would come up with all kinds of all kinds of uh, reasons that they would basically deny the right that is on paper. Um, and there are, are there no ones protecting no, no the one's people protecting. who are seeking the, the union? No, there's, there's no protection. But then when we started, we had to find out what exactly is going on. Why, why are people so against this type? I mean, why, why are they going against what is on paper, which, which we think is beautiful? Or which we all believe is beautiful. So we went back to the paper, so studied the Civil Union Act of 2006, and then we realized that somehow a clause was snicked in into this law that said that all officials have a right to refuse <laughs> to grant a same-sex marriage. <laughs> so, um, so basically they were doing something that was that the state said it's okay to do, but the same state basically said you are allowed to marry. Um, so this is how you would see that there's a, a big disjuncture. But I mean, on the other hand, you know, we talk about the economic dynamics that are, or the economic inequalities that are happening in South Africa. Um, you know, there's no, on, on paper, there's not supposed to be any form of discrimination on many levels, gender, sex, sexual orientation, religion, nationality, et cetera, uh, or birth. Um, but only recently, certain things have started changing. Um, you know, there's been a, 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 a difficulty for people who speak, I mean, we have 11 official languages, um, but you would know in terms of, you know, um, when, when you are engaging with politics, you know there's certain languages that are going to be promoted. Um, so, depending on who the president is, so because the first president was Nelson Mandela, so all the Kosas were, you know, were, were, were advanced in terms of politics, but also in terms of jobs. Um, and then it was Tabombeki, and, it, and, and that Kosaness was entrenched, so there was a Kosa Nostra. Uh, and now it's, <laughs> and, and then it was Jacob Zuma, and all the Zulus now <laughs> had to take over. And now it's Cyril Ramaphosa, and, <laughs> and uh, you know, it's a different, um, um, cultural group, ethnic. So, you know, there's always there's always something that you always have to agitate against to ensure that um, this thing that is so beautiful uh, is actually a reality. Yeah. And that's a lot of work. Yeah. Thank you very much. Because I'm coming back to you to talk about the nature of the the sexual violence that goes on. But I want to ask um, Ayodeji very quickly. Do you want to tell us a little bit about how you came to start um, Stand to End Rape Initiative? Um, Stand to End Rape Initiative started in 2013 and basically was just a hashtag. What we wanted to do is to break the silence around sexual violence. So it's bad enough that someone gets raped, but it's worse that society expects you to keep silent about it and not get help. And so we just started writing, um, you know, blogging about it, creating threads on Twitter, was Twitter specifically. And then a lot of people started reaching out to say, hey, I think what you're saying is what I've experienced, but I never knew was sexual violence. I didn't know it was rape. My uncle groped my breast as a child. I didn't know it was not okay for him to do that. And so people started unlearning, you know, what they've 
been used to for, for a long time. And so when we started getting so many stories, it felt like we were doing something incomplete. We were breaking the silence on behalf of these women, but then the women have not received help. They've not received support. And so in 2014, we became a full-blown organization providing mental, legal, and psychosocial support to survivors of sexual and gender-based violence at no cost. So we're a group of young people, about 200 of us across Nigeria, who are just providing help to women, men, boys, ensuring that no survivor has to keep silent about their experience. Thank you so much. And um, th there's a question I have for you both with this thing, this thing about violence that, w that we talk about and what's happening on our continent. How much of you know, our culture, and when, we, when I say culture, I mean our attitudes, our values perhaps, you know, as, as Africans, how much of that is responsible for the fact that there's so much sexual violence? Or do, do you perhaps think that there's no correlation? There absolutely is. So there was a time I was doing research about the pre-colonial era and just to see how women were treated in that time. You know, were women powerful? Did women have a voice before colonialism came in? Did women have, you know, the capacity to say, this is my story, this is my experience? And what I realized was there seems to be a disparity between then and now. So pre-colonial and post-colonial era. Back then, women had more power. Women were in po political spaces, your lodger, your Day, you know, holding spaces. In fact, my great grandmother told me a story where she said, if a man beats a woman back in her own days, the man will be ostracized from the community and the woman is free to marry someone else. Like women literally would leave abusive homes and their parents would support them. But we don't have that today. Women want to leave abusive homes. You have families saying, this water doesn't want to stay. We, <laughs> we, that's fine. So we have, you know, families saying "Ole dale mosu," which is a Yoruba term for "you cannot return to your home because you're married." But this doesn't happen before colonial era. So what changed? To be honest, I think as a people, our values changed, our communal spirit changed. Growing up, you know, I would see where neighbors would watch each, watch after each other's children. If something happens to your daughter, your neighbor will come and speak, you know, to you about it. But I've seen like now, like this is over 20 something years ago, but now it doesn't happen. Everyone's house is gated. We no longer have a community of people watching over each other. And should we talk about, you know, child marriage? Should we talk about female genital mutilation, where girls are mutilated because they do not want them to be promiscuous. promiscuous. When did promiscuity become a value for us to mutilate someone for? Yeah. When did, you know, beating a wife or your daughter or whatever the case may be, become something our culture embraces and, and keeps silent about? So yes, culture has a big role to play. If you go to communities, we had like community outreach um, this week, from Monday till Thursday, and my team members were telling me about how Healthcare workers were telling them that it's these days that women dress scantily that has made rape occur. But I wish I was there to show them pictures of our great grandmothers who adored their bodies and dressed as they please. And no one said, oh, because she's naked, I have to rape her. So there seems to be a bit of, you know, a shift in our culture. It's as if we've lost the sense of culture and communal values, where our mothers and great-grandmothers back in the days would tie wrappers over their chest and over their bootles, and that's all they were. And society did not say, oh, oh, I have to rape her. No, because that's something that, that um, I think it was Cheta on, on Twitter mm -hmm. when um, one of our ministers, or was it this same Shegonu Shewe, started talking about how they have a problem with nudity. And then he put up these pictures from about, you know, 90 years ago. I mean, even when I was growing up, if you go to the market, somebody's selling tomatoes, you know, they, they've only got something wrapped around their waist and they have a child child suckling. I mean, I wonder what would happen if, I mean, was that ever looked upon as, you know, being enticing? Because if you're, if you're objectifying a woman, I mean, that's your sickness. But I, I just want to understand what happened. Was there a shift in South Africa? I mean, she said that colonialism 
perhaps is partly responsible, responsible for this breakdown in cultural values or the shift? What do you think? I mean, what's the situation in South Africa? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's similar. But I, I think one of the two things that I would, uh, one particular thing I want to, uh, to draw out, sorry. One of the things I want to draw out is, um, is how the family has become a kind of regulatory um, space. Um, and I say the family because, you know, we want to talk about uh, the, you know, the private and the public. And the family is, is actually, is actually it, it allows for, for the continuity of violence, of sexual violence from the home or the private space into the public. And, and, and let me unpack that a little bit. So in the home or in the family space or the private space, um, violence is normalized through a number of things. So within South Africa, um, in, in two cultural groups, uh, Tosas and Zulus, they have, they have this notion. Which one are you? <laughs> just, just so we're clear, and uh, I, we know who to report you to. But which are you? Are you do you belong to either of those ethnic groups? You see, I can tell the answer that's coming. It's like when uh, the chief people say, hmm, "This house are Yoruba and Igbo people." But, but really, are you? Kosa. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, and so. Uh, uh, but the, the, the distinction is not so clear in actual fact because we are all cousins, as you know. Um, but amongst the Kosas and the Zulus, there's this idea, so it, it, and it becomes a cultural, uh, a rite of passage, um, and, a, and, a, and a very dominant practice where you are taught what we call ukunyamezela, to persevere, to endure. That word perseverance. Yes. But now that culture of Ukunyamezela, it starts in the home where the woman is, 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 is demanded to pardon the man at all times. Uh, she's demanded to wake up and survive every day. And she's also demanded to maintain the stability of the family because it is for the national good. Now, she walks out of the private space into the public. And as she embodies Ukunyamezela, in the world, she's regarded as what we call Imbogodo, the rock. So she has been trained in the practice of Ukunyamezela continuously surviving, surviving, and in the public domain, she's the rock. And the rock is a very celebrated uh, mantra in South Africa. We have this mantra. Uh, you see now I even forgot it. <laughs> you strike a woman, you strike a rock. So women are supposed to be so rocked so rockened that they cannot bleed and they cannot break. And that starts within the private space. I, I have to ask you because, is, what, so what are the expectations that society has of men? Because all this, I mean, I can understand perseverance. We hear about that quite a lot. Mm. I mean, I'm just listening to this rock thing, I'm exhausted yes. already. Yes, it, just, it's a, just, you know, I'm just thinking, how much more can I do in my life, you know? But, but, but when you talk about this sort of strength of character in many African cultures, that's what's expected of men. Oh. So if this whole rock thing, is there a, a male equivalent? Is there? <laughs> no, 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 I mean, is there? So, so what are society's expectations of men? If I'm, I'm, Because it looks like the entire responsibility of stability and strength has been put on women. Well, yes, the responsibility is put on women, and the responsibility is for women to elevate the men and to make the men their perpetual and their constant father. Father of the nation, father in the home. And okay. we saw this. Is that why it's okay for them to then 
um, physically abuse women because they see themselves as a paternal figure. Exactly. I so see. we saw this in the case of uh, Feza Gile Nzukelo Kuzwayo, who the world got to know as Kwezi. So Kwezi, or oh, let me say, the former president, Jacob Zuma, raped Kwezi in his home. And when, the, when there was a court case, society turned around and said, you, Kwezi, are the bitch we need to burn. And why society had to do that? It was because the woman who is supposed to be the child has now exposed and destabilized the home environment. And therefore, society had to discipline and punish that expose, exposure by saying, we will, well, you need to get out. You need to be ex exiled. And she was exiled. But in turn, we then elevated Jacob Zuma to become the most powerful president in the country. Because, we have, because the, role, the role of the woman is to elevate. Yeah? And until we disrupt, we, and, it, and it has to be our role, until we disrupt and choose not to participate in it, men will always be at the forefront and, be, and they will be continuously regarded as untouchable. Now the unfortunate thing that we then did through social media was to say men are trash, the hashtag. And, and I wondered, what does this mean for women? Because the man goes back into the home. So are we all dustbins? Yeah. <laughs> and we continued promoting the hashtag. Yeah. This is not true of Nigeria, thank goodness. <laughs> Please, can you tell us, tell her about our own great experience? <laughs> Let's see. Our so own men are not trash. I wish I could agree with you. I it's wish because I could. they are scum. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, but honestly, you know, I, I, we have similarities, definitely, because we're all Africans. Um, and what she has said is a true picture of how the private influences the public. So if you take an average 10-year-old boy and speak to him about gender equality, he cannot relate with you. He cannot understand. Because within the home, mommy tells Junior, go and play football, but tells Nkechi, go and cook for your brother. Mommy is helping to establish that fact that women belong in the kitchen, right? I don't want to say the other room. <laughs> In the kitchen, while the boys are to, you know, be creative, playing, even the way we, we create games, it upsets me. The games we create for boys and the ones we create for girls are really, really different. It's as though the boy has an upper mental capacity to deal with problems and, so, and problem solving, and women just have to fix basic Barbie, make hair because we're domestic human beings, right? And so this happens a lot within the family setting. If you ask a boy, he can't relate to you know, gender equality because he has seen daddy beat mommy and mommy will go back and kneel before daddy and apologize. Daddy, I'm be no fun kotsumoshi, which means daddy, I apologize for what I did. And this, I have seen a whole lot within the family setting in Nigeria. And if you ask most men, I take that back. If you ask most senators who are men right now, why they have refused to pass gender equality bill? They will tell you because women should not have the power to decide if they want to have one child, two children, or 10 children. They, as the authority within the home setting, have that power. So what is happening in their private life is now being you know, strengthened in their public an official capacity. And so women do not have rights to determine how many kids they want to have. You can't even determine that within the home. So imagine a child who gets married at the age of 15. How do you think they can determine how many kids they want to have? And data shows that people who marry at a very young age experience more violence than even the older people. 
It's really pathetic. What, what's, can you unpack that a bit? I'm just trying to understand how that works. Mm -hmm. So you get married early. Yeah. Why are you more susceptible? Why are you, is there a, a higher likelihood that you'll experience gender violence? Because culture, like she rightly explained, you are a child. Your husband is the father figure. So you have to respect your husband. But as a child, you're expected to assume the role of an older person, a wife. So when they want to chastise you, your age doesn't matter. They chastise you as a, a, like a wife, but you are actually a child. And so families of, you know, all this, um, Families of these um, marriages, you know, put pressure on the children to, you know, give birth on time, have more children for them because the older ones can no longer, no longer put to birth. But when the kids are unable to produce because the internal stuff has not, you know, fully formed, they experience more violence, they get more bitten, they get more stuffed. I don't know if anyone has seen the movie Dry. If you see the movie dry, you'd have a better understanding of how children actually experience more violence within the marriage. And I really hate saying children in marriage because it doesn't even tally. It doesn't at all. Okay, so this, this stuff that's happening in our societies, I'm not wearing my glasses, but is that Damilola Marcus? Please come join us. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. We are now complete. So could you test your mic? Because I want to ask this question, right? I will start with you, Dami Lola. But I want you to tell us very quickly um, about the market um, women, the market march, that, that thing that you organized. Tell us how it came to be. First of all, I'm so sorry that I'm late. Um, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to still speak. Um, so Market Match really pretty much started out as something very organic. Um, so there was a conversation happening online around harassment at the market. And then I realized that people older than me um, had the same experiences growing up. People were saying their mothers had the same experiences growing up. And I was like, why is nothing being done about this? It, this is something that's been happening for so long. Why is it OK? Why is it normalized? Obviously, nobody was saying I enjoy going to the market. And that didn't make sense to me, particularly because the public space is you can't say that there is anything like equality if the public spaces are not safe for women. So I was like, There's, there needs to be something done about this. And I just said, everybody has a right to protest. I mean, that's usually the first step. If you can come out together in solidarity and raise their voices, then that can be a solution. And that was how um, the market match came to be. And then I went online and asked for volunteers. and. Like magic, so many amazing women who were ready to take on the job volunteered, and it was really, really smooth planning and organizing it from that end. So, but there are people here who might not understand this harassment that goes on in the marketplace. Yeah. I've, I've experienced it. I've, I've, I mean, I don't know. It might not happen in South Africa the way it happens here, because it's like we have a degree in it. <laughs> but can you just explain it to people? And, and also, it might not actually happen in other parts of Nigeria, because I think Yaba in particular, Teju Osho, is just notorious for that nonsense. But can you tell us what, what happens when you you just kind of walk into the market as a young woman. Okay, so walking into the market, you have to be psychologically prepared um, because they will grab you, they will grope you, they will yell all sorts of things at you, um, inappropriate language. They will make you feel so conscious about your body, like you actually don't belong there. And it's ironical because like, that is where a lot of young girls in Lagos go to buy clothing, particularly Yaba, um, because of its proximity to Yaba Tech, Unilag, and a lot of schools. So it's such a shame that that is happening at that center. Um, there have been people who have, this is beyond sexual harassment, who have been assaulted at the market. 
And when you do the investigation and you find out about the politics within the market, you start to see that it's so deeply ingrained. After the match, um, it reduced for a bit. Um, during the match, they were quite violent. They were throwing stuff at us, um, pure water. Um, they even threw bread on somebody. It was weird. But at the end of the match, somehow the, mas the message was passed and then it reduced for a while. But of course, like <laughs> everything that you don't keep your eye on, it starts to um, yeah, continue again. So we went to the market to do a bit of research and we found out that the market committees are very segmented based on like the tribes in Nigeria. We have the Igbos, we have the Yorubas, and the Yoruba market leaders are on the top of the hierarchy, and they have affiliations with government, politicians, and they need the cooperation of the markets to make that happen. So strict fines and penalties are not necessarily set in place because they have to work, to, it's like a union. Um, and then when you ask, okay, who do these people respect and listen to? Nobody wants to step up to the plate to take on the responsibility. So there's a lot of politics happening. And they will tell you, when you speak to the market leaders, they'll tell you that the street belongs to the government. So if the government is not arresting sexual harassers on the street because it actually is a crime, then what can they do? They're not the police. So it's really ingrained in the culture. And I, even the day I went to speak to to the leaders. I was harassed on that same day. And then I had to call him out that this is exactly why I'm here. Yeah. So it is ingrained. And it kind of speaks to, to what you were saying earlier as well, Zetu. Because you, it, it, it's just confusing. Is it that all these men who were harassing women in the marketplace, is there a connection? I mean, what's the connection between that act in itself, which they're perpetuating in public? What's the relationship between that behavior and their behavior at home? So one has to ask, is it that they have a lot of pent up frustration and anger, you know, which they then go and take out on women in the market? Or it, what culture, in what world, is this horrible behavior acceptable? That's what I don't understand. Ayo, JJ, do you have an answer? And then uh, I'm gonna come to you. I think I, I, I talked about it a, a little bit earlier. Every person on the street, in the office, in a university, are a representation of who they are at home. Okay. It's who you are at home that you are outside. So when I hear people say the reason men perpetrate this violence is because, you know, we've told men from a young age to be strong, to keep their emotions together. And so they compound everything together and then they don't know how to express it. So violence is always the best form. So what we, what we are saying then is, can we begin to talk about men actually expressing their emotions? Will that actually reduce the number of violence happening? I don't think so. Because truth be, be told, a lot of men within the home have this hierarchy of I am the older being and the women are the weaker being. So whether you're in the house, on the streets, in a university, in a workspace, you are a lesser being to them and they would definitely want to harass you because again, they've grown up to see the disparity in, 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 in family setting where women are here, men are there. It's just, it's so sad when you see to it survivors of domestic violence, and you talk to them and say, so if your husband is beating you at home, what does he do to his secretary? And then they will tell you, Madam, the way in they beat me for office, now in they harassing, let me speak English, the way he beats me at home is the way he harasses the secretary in the workspace. It's a pattern. It's always a pattern. And what I've seen amongst um, young men that I speak to is they do not even understand what sexual violence really is because they feel like when I touch you unexpectedly, I'm validating you as a being, as a woman. If I tell you fine girl in the market, I'm expressing how beautiful, you should be grateful for that. A higher being is validating your existence. Shouldn't you be grateful? 
children should be grateful. And that's the mentality. You know, if you go to workspaces, men assume that it's okay for them to tell their, their um, colleague, you look sexy. Very okay, very normal. And it's our norms, social norms, how men and women, it even starts from a very young age. Let me paint this example and I'll pass it over. When you have a boy and a girl, if a girl wants to take a pen, a girl is more likely to ask, Junior, please, can I take your pen? But when a boy wants to take a pen, he takes it. And when the lady says, no, like, am I not playing with you? Am I not playing with you? It's as though, <sighs> it's, think it's an entitlement. It's, you should be grateful. I'm just trying to play with you. They don't understand what it means, you know, to respect each other, interpersonal relationship, and that's where it grows to public space. So what happens within the home, from childhood to adulthood, is definitely what you see in, in the public space. Okay, so I'm trying to now see how this, um, how does this feature, how does it, how is it connected to corrective rape, for instance? Because if you, if we have a situation where we're saying that, you know, what happens in the private space is almost always, um, you know, a, well, what happens in the public space is almost always a reflection of what's going on in the private space. I'm worried about what these men who feel that by raping a lesbian, they can convert her in some way. I'm trying to understand what they might be doing in their own homes. It, it worries me. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I, think we're, I think it worries many people. Uh, I think before I even engage with the issue of corrective rape, I think it's important that we ask men to actually say that as a man, I am not okay. <laughs> That's a difficult thing. They're not okay. They are not. They are not okay. <laughs> no, no. There have been, there've been rumors that they're slightly under evolved, but we can't really hold them. No, it's, it's, it's not their fault. Those that, are, that bit of it. That is a historical fact. But yeah, men are not okay. Do you, would you like all the men to just accept that right now? Yes. Okay, right, men, men can you just say I'm not okay? I'm not okay. There you go. <laughs> Are you okay, Tando? Yes. <laughs> okay. And right. men, sh I think also men should start acknowledging that as men, they are not human. And that's a difficult thing for me to say as an African. As much as I love human beings, but no human wakes up in the morning or goes to bed, or whether they sleep or not, but has their first imagination is to rape, kill, violate, strangle another human. That is not human. And most men do that. They think about it, they desire it, and they do it. So maybe Tando knows this best. What is a man in our context? When I can say men are not human. And to be human is not an, is not an easy thing. We are, all, we are all in the process of being human. And so when men accept that they are not human, then what are they? Yeah? Three, men hate women. Even the ones they marry, <laughs> unfortunately. And it's a painful thing to say. And it's a painful thing to say as a person who comes from what I would consider a loving environment. <laughs> Is it, is it fair for us to generalize in that way? I'm just, I'm asking because, um, you know, when people say men are trash, mm. a lot of the guys say not all men. Not all men. Mm. I don't know why they don't want to accept the truth, but is it, <laughs> <laughs> is it, is it, but is it fair for us to generalize? Should, should we, should we just say it's all men? 
I think, or, or I think we, we need to understand the condition. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The condition. So when I talk about a man, it's not necessarily that this man or individual. It's the condition of what what man has been allowed to be. Yeah. And, well, and men, and, and, and as an individual man can walk away from that. Or, or are we talking about what is it is that defines a man, or what defines manhood yeah. within an African um, society? I think that's what, oh, masculinity, I think, that's it, that's it. But, but okay, so we, we know and we accept, I think we can all agree that there is a problem, right? Where do we go from here? How do we protect the next generation? The reason I desperately wanted to come to Market March, I couldn't make it, but I came to the, the next um, events that you organized, was because I was terrified for my own children. I was thinking, I have two daughters. I can't, I'm too scared even now to send them to Yaba on their own because I know how I felt at 16 years old when I walked through Teju Osho. By the time I came out, in fact, I was convinced I was naked, even though I wasn't. You know, I, I felt so violated, and I cannot imagine, you know, what, why didn't I do something to make sure that you didn't experience that? So what are we all doing? I mean, where do we go from here? It can be what you are doing, but it can also, can you proffer advice? And then I'm going to open it up to the public after that. Okay, so um, I don't think it's a question of um, what can we do. I think it's a question of are we sure that we're doing something? So we cannot, I tell people all the time, patriarchy is something that has been happening for millennia. You can, in fact, to reimagine a world without patriarchy is to Im reimagine the entirety of the world. And imagination is not so easy. So finding that solution is not something that happens overnight. Or it is, are we sure that we're actively doing something? Or are we ready exactly, to do something? Exactly, exactly. For Market Match, I didn't um, imagine what it would mean for us to do that. I knew that that was one step. But I wasn't certain that after this, this would happen. In fact, a lot of people who spoke to me after the match kept asking me, so what are the next steps? I'm like, don't ask me that. <laughs> like, don't ask me that. Allow me even process what just happened. So I think it's important that we um, breathe and we give ourselves the room to make mistakes in our fight towards undoing the patriarchy because it is so hard to imagine the world outside of that. And to just um, add to what you said about men, I don't think that it is in any way a, an unfair generalization because it is not just individual men, it's men as a class. So even in the market, for instance, there are men who do not believe in harassing women as they walk through the market, but there is a culture in which the manhood within Yaba market is validated for some groups of men by their actions towards women until masculinity stops being dependent on subjugating femininity, then we will not be able to remove men as a class from the conversation. Absolutely. Ayodeji. Um, when you asked me, is it fair to say all oh, men, and I said no, um, it's because while we are doing this work and this advocacy, it's also important that language and context is always placed in the right spaces. So what happens is when we give the ideology that, you know, I understand men as a class, and I absolutely agree with that, um, but I'm speaking to indi individuality now in terms of men as individuals. When we talk about, you know, men as come, men are trash, all of these things, it's a reminder of the men action in, in, as, as a class, but it's also kind of pushing away some if or she's who would want to be a part of the movement. 
who would so want allies. to be allies, if or she allies, who would want to be a part of the movement. And so I'm, I'm always, you know, saying it's important that men change this and we need more men so we, we can prof state the problem and also prefer solution. So men are a problem, men are doing this, but we also need men to change this behavior and change this pattern. So with that being said, um, <laughs> what do we do? Thank you. Sorry, I've had a long week, so my brain is everywhere. Um, in terms of what do we do, I'll say it in three spaces. Um, advocacy. So Stand to Andre, for example, cannot be the only one leading the conversation. We have Mirabel Center, we have the Lagos State Domestic and Sexual Violence Response Team, where if we have so many organizations, what we need to then do is to take this conversation to communities, to have deep-hearted conversations with men as a group. So I was speaking earlier that we had a program um, with healthcare um, providers. And people who survivors should ordinarily walk up to to get help were telling us how the way women dress is a reason for them to be raped. How the way women speak to their husbands within the home setting is a reason for them to be slapped. And these are people who should prefer solution. That takes me to the second thing, legal reforms. So we have the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Bill. It's now an act because it's been passed. But because we run a federal system, once a law is passed at the federal level, you need the states to adopt it. How many states of the 35 states, aside the FCT, where it is you know, um, applicable, how many of them have passed this, this bill to protect women's rights? We have the Gender and Equal Opportunities Bill. It's been rejected more than five times. It's still in the House. Sexual Harassment Bill, thank goodness for the Sex for Grades documentary. All of a sudden, Senate remembers that, oh, we have this bill. Yeah. Let's start working to pass it. What happened in 2016 since we've been advocating for that bill? You kept silent. But because we did something, we showed a documentary of the rot yes. in the university system. And to show that university systems don't have systems in place to protect students, all of a sudden, a legal reform action is happening. So that's something we need to do. Are you a filmmaker? Make a film. Are you a writer? Write stories, write books. Are you um, a journalist? I see some, I mean, respect to a lot of my friends who are journalists. We need to begin to look at human angle stories more deeply. Yeah. Don't just write them because you want us to read your newspaper or your article. Write them because you care. Write them from a humane aspect. Let's engage our political leaders. How many people know the senators representing them? How many have engaged them? These are the people that your taxpayers' money. We can't reach them because of the convoy. <laughs> <laughs> we can absolutely try to reach them. We can. We must engage. So as a young person, you don't have to be a politician. You don't have to vie for position. But can you engage in activism in the local area? How many people in your community have you enlightened about sexual violence? How many people have you trained? Do you train your sons, for example? You are in church, right? You have boys in church. What conversations do you have with them? Because at the end of the day, we need to change social norms, which is my third aspect. We need to change thinking, help boys unlearn. Some of them don't even know any different. And I got to know this. I used to think that every person who violates a woman knows what they are doing. But there was a day I was on a radio station and someone phoned in and said, I'm a rapist. And I, I, I was shocked. And he said, because as a young boy, my house help molested me for years. And for me, it was the normal way of having sex. I didn't know it as violent. I didn't know it as, you know, non-consensual. I thought it was just a normal way. I was just being introduced to it at a very young age. And he has been doing that to so many women because he did not know. And so we need to help them unlearn these behaviors and patterns and teach them the right thing. I'm not a problem identifying person. I'm more of what can you do better? What can you learn? And what change can you make? Thank you so much, Ayadiji. Yeah, perhaps to add on that, I mean, I, I, just to, to, to take some of um, the issues that my colleague was saying, um, you know, I think language is a very important thing. Um, and, um, and in South Africa, one of the things that we did as this organization, Free Gender, was to get to the point where we no longer use the term corrective rape. 
because no, 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 no. I mean, I think it's important that we talk about why it's not used because we we automatically go to it. One of the reasons was that it. it um, we started realizing that this term is only used towards when we're talking about black lesbians and black lesbians of a particular socioeconomic status. So you had to live in the township, uh, you had to probably not have a job, you didn't finish school. Um, and, and, and part of that languaging was also saying to society, it's actually okay. It's okay for, for men to rape lesbians because they are correcting them for society. Yeah? Um, so then men become heroes because they're doing something for societal good. Um, and so even in courts, we had to go and, and sensitize um, you know, legal officials, uh, magistrates, actually train them as, as, as an NGO, train them how to have this conversation, how to understand um, rape and violence towards women, and also how to change the language. So instead of saying corrective rape, we say men's violence, which is very different. It's men who violate, men's violence towards women, or towards lesbian women, or towards, so then it, it puts men at the forefront of the act that they do, yeah, and they are thinking. Um, so small little things like that, which you don't, we do, you know, you think, oh, it's, it's so easy to describe this thing, corrective rape, and then everybody will know it, but no. And what we also started realizing is that because it's, it, it's demarcated to a particular small group of people, so if you are um, um, a wealthy woman, who experiences sexual violence in the home, there will be no support from black lesbians because they believe, already they also believe that there's no connection because you, don't, you didn't get the rape that they got. Yeah, it's a different kind of rape. Okay. And, and rape, so, rape is rape. Yeah, well, of yeah. course, yeah. Rape is rape. So, so trying to forge connections between women's movements, women's organizing, so that we can see that the violence that a woman who is a lesbian, a woman who is heterosexual, or a woman who is a trans woman experience is all the same. Um, and and we, are, we are all engaging in trying to eliminate that violence. Um, and then one th the other thing that we did was to actually have this conversation with, um, with this uh, criminal justice system, where we had to engage, engage with them to understand that when you are listening to a court case, or when you are adjudicating a court case, if a woman comes and says, I have been violated, the evidence that you ask for should not be evidence that has to violate her again. The fact that she came and said she was violated, it's enough. It is sufficient evidence. And we should not be in court and be raped again, because that's what we were experiencing, the perpetual rape of survivors and victims. Um, and that work is very difficult, because the legal system is based on providing evidence. And the evidence has to unwrap you completely. Um, and so how, how then do you do you go back to court and say, I feel violated, and that is it? The, I mean, I've, 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 I, I kind of have an idea of some of the, the questions that might come out of that. Because, I'm, and I'm saying this, some of the, the things I'm asking, they're really based on conversations that I have seen on Twitter. So again, somebody's going, a uh, 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 you know, poor man is going to say, oh, but what, it, what about the false, you know, allegations of rape? How do we then deal with that? I mean, if, 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 if we're no longer sort of relying on hard evidence and having to put that woman through that, so what if, you know, it's, it never happened and a woman has created that? I'm, I'm just, I'm saying what I know somebody is going to ask men. They can't help it. Just <laughs> forgive them, but give them an answer. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, you're right, it's, um, and, and that question comes up a lot. Um, but it's also, but for, for us as activists, the, the, the important question, I think you were raising it, is that some women don't even know that they're violated. Right? And so it's not, it's, it's not our business to show, to help men understand that you didn't violate. Our business is to 
help women, to show women that you have been violated. Because many women don't know sometimes that they're violated because the violence has become so normalized. Right? Yeah. And so even in, even, even in a context of the legal system, we, we, have to, we have to be able to say that, well, if, if, if you as a magistrate want evidence mm. to show that this man didn't do this work, you also have the responsibility of showing evidence that this woman didn't experience this work. Absolutely. And <laughs> court officials don't know how to do that. I hear you. So I'm going to be less selfish now and, and let the audience um, come in. Yes. So one, where's the mic? One, two, three, four. Good morning, and thank you so much uh, to the panel for your incisive educational, educative analysis. It's a man I've learned so much. I just want to make a comment on dress code. Uh, I'm a political scientist, and we political scientists, we see the hands of the state everywhere. And what I didn't see in your analysis is the hands of the state. I grew up in Kano in the 1960s. If I died as a teenager in 1970 and come back to Kano today, I won't recognize the place visually because of the dress code has changed completely. In the 60s in Kano, the hijab hardly existed. There, are two, there is one dress code. When, somebody, when a woman is married, she'll have a small piece of clothes that she'll usually wear on her shoulder. If she's not married, nothing at all. She just dress normally. So people tend to think that society changed. The society never changed. 1978, there was a great Sharia debate. During the Sharia debate, the Ministry of Education issued a directive to primary and secondary schools that all girls must wear the hijab. That was in 1978. It didn't exist before 1978. Think about it. Now two generations of women have grown up, and people in Kano now think because we are a Muslim society, this is the way we've always dressed. It was an instruction from the government. In 1978-79, I was an assistant lecturer in the university. And they came to us and said, look, universities should show example. Primary schools use hijab. Secondary schools use, use hijab. Why not university? And we laughed at them and said, you are joking? For the last 20 years, there's a big sign in front of Amadou Bello University giving the dress codes. So I think as you analyze these issues, you should always remember that things don't change in society till something makes a change. And you have to identify what is the source of that change. Then one word on men not being human. I mean, of course, I agree with you completely. But maybe as an academic, I would say, aren't you very presumptuous that humans has to do with something good? All the evil in human history, where did it come from? Humans. So don't associate hum being human with being uh, good. Um, thank you very much. My name is Aisha. I'm not too sorry. Yeah, okay. Go on. Okay. 
So um, I want to first say thank you for the amazing panel. I felt very emotional listening to you, and I almost cried. So <laughs> my question is very complicated, but I'm going to try to simplify it and make it really short. So um, I come from a community, um, OAU, I school in OAU, my last year. It's a very conservative Muslim school, the Muslim community. That's right, the students, people that went to OAU know how conservative it is. And um, yes, the Muslim community, like a small student Muslim community, not the Muslim community, the student Muslim community, they practice a small strand of Islam called Salafism. So you find a lot of sexual, um, especially spiritual abuse connected to sexual violence that goes on. Um, my friends would that come for, from OU, and you can check this on Twitter, we've made conversations about it. Now my question is, in the Muslim community, um, especially someone who was the co-president of the Muslim Students Association, I found out that it was very difficult for me to address the issue of spiritual abuse connected to sexual violence, things like um, a man beating his wife, because we all they all marry very early, so we get situations like that. Or, for example, someone wanting to, a brother wanting to rape a sister in a very vulnerable position. These are things that actually do happen. Or even in Ede, right beside Ife, there is a man that was taken, and this was on the premium times, he was taken to court because he raped a girl. He's very notorious for serially marrying a lot of wives. Now I know that there's church to a church meet rather but how do you do this in, and i know mona has also started conversations around you know the muslim community but i in the nigerian muslim community especially how do you start conversations and make change regarding this issue thank you very much Hello, uh, my question is very simple and it's for all the What's panelists. Your name? My name is Shala. Um, my question is, how do you reconcile yourself in a culture where you don't seem to be valued or the so-called values don't seem to value you as 50% of the culture? How do you reconcile yourself as an African woman, as a Nigerian woman, as a South African? Should we take those two very quickly? Right? So within religious communities, for instance, where, how do you start the conversation? I mean, we can talk about, we, we know what's happening with the church, Me Too, with uh, Biodun Fatu Imbo, who clearly has um, been helping himself to the women in the congregation. But how, I mean, and nothing's really happened. To be honest, yeah, what are the consequences? Um, Please enlighten so us. Regarding the um, Biodin Fatwa Yimbo case, because Stere is involved in the case, um, we already felt like a case in court. Um, and just um, yesterday, we got word that the court misplaced some of the papers that we had presented. Um, and then a letter was written to inform the court of the things that were missing. And then the court still says they cannot understand what is missing. So our judicial system is just a space that allows perpetrators to go scot-free. This does not mean that we are tired. We'll, we'll keep pressing until we get justice for, um, for Busola, but that's a different situation. In terms of the Muslim community, um, I know it's a very delicate community. Um, I spoke to one sheikh, um, is a very popular, Lema, Lemu? Yes, Sheikh Lemu. Um, he's someone who is very progressive in his thinking and how, you know, he's very interested in, you know, starting or pushing movements around eliminating violence against women and girls within the Islamic community. So I think that's someone you might want to reach out to. That's one aspect. But on the aspect of, you know, starting a movement, I would say social media is your best, you know, place to actually start. Can you gather women in, do, in that small community and begin to talk to them about what you have seen? It cannot be only you. You are representing your community. Just like Damlola had the idea and then asked for volunteers, and that's how a movement started. So do you want to lead that movement? Do you want to get people who are like-minded? Help them. They might not even know that what you see is a problem, because for them it's normal. So do you want to help them unsee what they know and just you know, start a conversation online, start from the grassroots, reach out to community leaders or religious leaders like Sheikh Lemu, who is more progressive in his thinking, and maybe you know we can push the Muslim Me Too movement. But again, it cannot start from you know people outside the community. And I'll tell you why, because you are the best person who understands the problem, and you're the best person to push the solution. I, I, I mean, 
something I just want to say, and I love Sheikh Lemo, I, I love what he's doing, but the only um, kind of reservation that I have sometimes is that when he's addressing these issues, he's clearly um, on the, uh, out there to support the women, but it's always kind of a paternalistic sort of way. We have to protect women. We have to look after them. So it's not about allowing them to just be individuals, because sometimes I don't want anybody to protect me. I just want to be. I just want to to be myself, you know, and I feel, I mean, I don't know if there's a space for that within the conversation that we're having, I mean, that a lot of people are having about the Muslim communities in Nigeria, or maybe if that's something you want to pursue. And I think what I'm simply trying to say is that relying sometimes on men, um, it, it, we need allies, but you really have to think this through yourself as a woman because you understand the issues more than he ever could. So, I mean, I'm just saying, because you mentioned that name in particular, so I have to say that, but yeah. Um, so, I don't really know much about um, the Muslim community in Nigeria, um, so I would reserve... Which community do you know about? <laughs> Do you know about the Christian community? <laughs> yeah, a little bit, but I feel like when it comes to um, religion, religion is a space for hope, is a space for um, connecting with, giving meaning to life. Um, a lot of the reasons why people worship is tied to that, um, is giving, is moving survival beyond an instinct. So oftentimes when you challenge this, it's almost like you're challenging people's being. So, um, and in that sense, it's left to the people who identify with certain religions to make the decision for themselves to alter it. So I'm saying religion can be altered because it is culture. Um, and has, uh, as exactly, and as culture evolves, so can it. If you look at Christian history, it has changed up from the time of Jesus Christ up until now. So, but it is going to be an internal revolution. So I, I wouldn't be able to Com um, comment on that, but I, I am fascinated by the second question about culture and kind of marrying the idea that one is can be to some regard proud of their culture and still realize that that culture has contributed to their oppression. Um, I would say the same thing. Culture too evolves, and I think that it is almost naive to perceive culture as a singular thing. Culture is deeply fragmented and it is deeply subject to reinterpretation. So if um, the parts of Yoruba culture, for instance, I'm Yoruba, and the part of Yoruba culture that I identify with, I uphold it because that is something that I am in choosing to internalize as part of who I am. And that's a choice that I am making. However, there are so many other aspects of Yoruba culture that I do not identify with, and I've chosen not to identify with because that affects how I perceive my sense of self. So I think that once we realize that culture is deeply fragmented, fragmented and there's so many different um, tiny parts and bolts and screws that make up an entire culture, we become more at peace with tearing it apart and taking parts of it that um, make sense to us. And then that should give us the bravery to also challenge the parts of it that are wrong. Because when you realize that it is made up of bits and pieces, we can change them for better parts that make the engine run smoother. I, I totally agree with you, and I often say that I, we're not here to, to serve culture. Our culture should serve us. So we must be courageous and confront it. And if there's an aspect of our culture that's killing us, we have to throw it away. We just have to. Do you agree? Uh, yeah, yeah I, I completely agree. Um, I mean, many years ago, when I started uh, working on issues, on LGBTQ issues, um, this is in the mid-90s, um, everybody, you know, everybody around was like, why, why are you doing this? You know, 
it's it's not important, um, it's unknown, it's, you know, it's, it's un-African, etc. Um, and doing it for the past 20 years has actually paid off because what you see now is, is a new kind of culture. A culture of women who feel proud that they, they're called lesbians, who feel proud that they are queer, and they're also African, yeah? And so choosing to disregard some things and go with the ones that work, we are also in the process of recreating culture. And I think we need to know that, that we are creators of culture. Yes, yeah. we, we, absolutely, we absolutely have that power. Right, and um, there were other hands, Babawa. Um, I, the way I see it is that you can have a lot of people with a lot of power uh, and a psychological profile of the victim, right? And you just put in a little bit of biasness, you have a huge fire and you come up with hashtags such as men are trash and suddenly the woman is the rubbish bin. My question is, can't women then also be accountable for actually being the enablers of the behavior that is instilled within men? Because men don't raise themselves. They are raised by women and absent fathers. And then we get surprised when they turn around, they can't call women while we police our children in our homes that they shouldn't wear bum shorts while men can go to the fridge topless. All right. Oh, yes, Gavin, and then we'll take those two questions. Um, this is a, a sort of speculative question because I honestly don't know the answer to that. But um, a few years ago, I, I, I wrote a book um, on um, genes and gender. And I, one of the things I did was I looked at, at education performance, um, first of all, in Britain. And I found that there was a growing gap between girls and boys at all levels, up to, through university, right from the start. Um, and it wasn't remaining static. Girls were just more and more outperforming boys. And I wondered if that was just a UK thing, an anti-learning culture. So I looked at United States. Um, I looked uh, at South Africa, and I looked at China, and very, there was a very similar profile. I mean, I don't know what the situation is in, in Nigeria. Um, and what I'm, I was wondering, because in the UK we've seen a rise um, in the number of reported rapes um, and a rise uh, in, in violence against women, at least re reported. Um, and I wondered if there was that correlation, whether there was a, might be any causal relation between the failure of men in the education system because of this anti-learning culture and the violence um, which, we, which we're talking about. And by the way, I'm not suggesting that, that, that the solution um, is that girls do worse. I'm saying that, that, that if, if there is a solution, it's, we need, to, we, we need to, to, to get men and boys to change their attitudes to learning. Um, so, uh, but I'm, it's an open question. Thank you very much. Should we take that very quickly? Because, I mean, some people say, I've heard it, some people even saying the reason there's so much rape um, around these days is because the men are, are frustrated because they don't have work. <laughs> but I'm serious, they're saying unemployment is, you've not heard that before. Oh, they've said it. They've said it. What, what do you have to say to those clever men saying that? So the idea here is that there's this fundamental um, issue where people think that patriarchy is something that men and women equally suffer from. Uh-uh. In patriarchy, there's an oppressive system, and wherever there is oppression, there is the oppressor and the oppressed. Within that oppressive system where you say that um, someone is oppressed, being oppressed and being a victim should not be a, should not be a, um, 
a, an issue. What becomes an issue is when victimhood re reigns supreme over action. And that is not what we see in feminist spaces, for instance, or spaces like this. The conversation, like she said, is, um, why don't you, instead of shake claim, why are we, we shouldn't look for a paternal leader. We're not in a position where we say we are oppressed and let's sleep. We're in a position where we understand that our oppressors cannot take off our chains. They can only hand us better chains. So we understand that we're the ones who would review the system on our own terms and within our own power. That does not make victimhood a bad thing. It makes it a facilitator. So I will say something about the women who encourage the patriarchy. While they are indeed a problem, and while they are a major issue, you cannot compare the impact to the perpetrators of violence. So I'll give you an example. Say someone is in a situation of survival. It is almost as if to say that, I think we need to bring a new sense of empathy for our mothers and our grandmothers and the other women that are quote unquote not as liberated in mind as we are and we understand their position as that of survival because they are not the primary benefactors of the patriarchy they are looking for ways to survive within it and sometimes that means enabling the system so we must have the conversation around how they enable the system but we cannot make that the center focus of dismantling in the system because at the end of the day I've seen in situations where there are honor killings where sons kill their mothers for dishonoring them I've seen situations like that I've even seen situations where men do not when they're in they hoard power and oppress mothers and give their daughters a little more freedom so we must understand where the power lies, and we must be strategic about how we take the power back. And that means centering the conversation around male violence and their benef the benefits that they get from patriarchy, and understanding that what they suffer in patriarchy is the side effects of their drug. It is not the direct oppression. Do we have, um, I think we can take one last question. Very quickly, anyone? Yes? South Africans are on fire. <laughs> um, thank you guys, thank you so much. I've learned so much. Uh, this was a really great panel. Um, I'm, it's just a thought that sparked, right? We, la we compartmentalize as, as human beings, and I'm hearing it, and I love what you said about language, and I'm hearing how we always add in prefixes, right, uh, to our experience, especially as black people. It's black body, it's not body, right? It's corrective rape, it's non-consensual sex, it's, it's domestic violence, but violence is violence, right? And we try to compa compartmentalize it based on our experiences, because poverty is violence and I'm not poor, then it's a different kind of violence from what I'm experiencing. Because I, I might have not been sexually abused, then non-consexual sex or I don't know, those terms that they use is something else. Is it maybe also because the kind of system we live in, um, we, we have to faint for a little bit of privilege, like of privileges, and the minute, it, uh, even the oppressed are privileged in some sense, so the minute we, we disrupt the whole system, we will lose that sense of privilege. So we keep to what we can and we fight for what we can't. I don't know. <laughs> is, it, is, is that maybe part of the whole reasoning? I don't know, yeah. It, you, nobody is going to let you get away with just saying sure. <laughs> Answer your sister. <laughs> yes, I've, I've heard people talk about, um, is, is it uh, like oppression politics? What is like um, trying to fight for position within oppression or the levels of oppression? So perhaps that's, perhaps it is, it is that. I haven't, I haven't fully thought through that question, yeah.
DG. Um, just to talk about your question around um, boys' education, failing, and then violence against women and girls. Um, I want to take you from the northern part of Nigeria. We have. I mean, up until recently, where there's been advocacy for girl child education, we had more boys in school and girls were not in school, but that did not reduce the rate of sexual violence. So for me, yes, we need to create safe spaces for you know, boys and their emotions and how they react to situations. But then again, we need to pinpoint what the violence is. It's basic disrespect for human rights and bodily autonomy. It has nothing to do with maybe you failing in university or school, or maybe you're upset or whatever it is. We must teach boys how to manage emotions, but let's separate that conversation from violence because by comparing both, you're reducing, you're indirectly trying to make, not, not directly, indirectly trying to make an excuse for why the violence happens. Oh, it's because, you know, boys are failing more, so emotionally they are drained, so they are expressing violence through rape. I don't agree with that narrative, and so we need to separate that. That's one. And for your comments regarding the state, I did mention how public officers use policies to, you know, control women's bodies and access to their rights. I use the GOB as an example. And thank you so much for giving, you know, clarity to during your era as, as to how women in Kano used to dress. Because they refuse to teach us history in school. We don't know. I many people are engaging in the Ministry of Education since they took out history from our curriculum. But I heard they brought it back. What history are they teaching us? <laughs> that's all. That, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, they, they have. I'm not sure. Because I don't know. Since we now have a generation of people who didn't study history, where are you going to get the teachers who are now going to go and teach history? They should. Maybe they should just stick to social studies. <laughs> Before I, I say um, a really big thank you to, to all of you, I mean, for you, these are my sisters, um, but you've come all the way from, from South Africa to be with us, and we're so grateful. But I, I, I just want to, to share something that, you know, that we've created at Ake Festival, and it's a booklet called We Must Talk About This. And it says, what you need to know about sexual violence. And it contains, um, I think, uh, can I use the word testimonies? Yeah? It's, it, yeah, experiences um, of, of five women, four women and a man. We, we got some of these stories. Actually, a member of our staff at the Book Bus Foundation is the author of one of the stories. I mean, they're real life encounters, real things that happen to real people. And what we did was that we had to choose out of all these stories we had because we wanted to show the spectrum. You know, and you've said, you've said a lot of people, women don't even know that they're, ex they're being, you know, sexually assaulted or violated. They don't know that they have a right. They don't know that there's anything wrong with it. We think it's something we have to accept. So we wanted to show, you know, the different types. So we have somebody who's written something about mar being in the market and the effects that it has had. Because it's important for people to have this education. I feel that, yes, we shouldn't make excuses for men. But I also feel that when we put the information out there, then you really don't have an excuse. So we've created and we've printed 20,000 copies of this booklet. And the reason, thank you very much. And it's also got information, by the way. It's got, you know, what is sexual violence? Who perpetuates it? Where is it most likely to happen? What to do if you are, you know, uh, if you experience sexual violence? And then in the, at the very end, just to make everybody's life really difficult, um, what, <laughs> what we've put there is a pledge. Yes. So the idea is you write your name and where, you read the pledge to yourself, you have to promise me you'll do that, you sign it, you date it, you take a photograph of it and you put it on social media. But we also want you to take loads of copies home. Go and give it to everybody you think. We all know men who need this booklet, do we not? Yes. 
Yeah? So I want you to give the men you believe need it, but then give it also to the ones that you think don't need it. Because a lot of the times, those ones are the ones that really need it. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So please um, take as many copies of, of this. I somehow managed to con um, Open Societies or Siwa to fund this. Um, yeah, it, it didn't take much convincing by the time I put my stories out there. But yeah, they have funded this project and I'm so grateful. And I also want to say if you want to fund, um, if you want to, you know, donate to printing more copies, unfortunately, we can't send them into secondary schools because the parents will say we're teaching their children about sex. Wow. Of course we have to, but I'm not going to be the one who's going to do it. Yeah? But they can get the booklet by accident. <laughs> you know what I mean? You just take it and make a mistake and leave it in a school by, by mistake. So please make that sort of mistake if you can, you know. Make sure it gets around. Please, young boys, teenage boys, please give this to them. Because it might save, it's going to save a lot of women, but I think will also save a lot of men. So on that note, I want to thank you, Zetu. Thank you. We love you. We love your work. Oh, I think you. a lot of my my sisters here in Nigeria will want to talk to you yeah we need your voice we want you to come to Nigeria more often to come and inspire our wonderful wonderful um, girls and our women especially the queer ones yeah thank they you. Thank need you. to hear from people like you and thank you so much Ayodeji for the work that you do stand Stand to end rape. Yes. You see, let me tell you, eh, one day I just want you to be president. I don't care. I, uh, I just want you to run life. Come and run Nigeria. Yeah? That's what we need. Because the work this woman is doing, you all saw sex for grades. She had a hand in that. Anything you, you hear, where men have been put in their place, Ayodeji is there. <laughs> But more than that, where men are being held accountable, you will hear or see stand to end rape. And I mean, this is a young woman. And for her to be doing, it gives me confidence. And of course, with Dami Lola Marcus as well, the amazing stuff that she's doing, getting us to go out there and match. When Dami Lola announces something is happening on Twitter, I don't even care what it is, I just want to be there. I want to be there to support them. I want to be there to, to just be behind her. So she knows when she looks back. Back, I even got Ola, the last one they organized. I got him to ride his bike in front of us in case we got oppressed by other men. So we wanted them to beat him first. Then <laughs> while they are beating him, we can run away. And he obliged and um, he did that for us. But thank you so much for everything that you do. Now, I am proud of you. Nigeria is proud of you. Ake Festival is proud of you. Strength, strength, strength to all of you. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening. Sorry, um, one moment, please. I also want to acknowledge and thank the other um, organizations run by young women like myself that have taken part in these matches as well. Um, we will not be silent through the eyes of the African woman as equals Africa. You guys are doing so much for us. Thank you.